Chapter 29 I know it doesn't make any sense, and I know it's not fair, but looking at my busted up wall, it's not Grieg or my grandpa I'm mad at, but Dan. As if he left that box on my front porch. As if he plopped this robot down in my life. As if he programmed the thing to break my kitchen window and then put a couple hundred dollars worth of damage in my wall. I pace around my bedroom. I walk from the wall to my bed, then from my bed to my dresser, then from my dresser to my desk, and back to my bed, so I can start the whole thing over again. Grieg watches. His big metal square of a head pivots on his little neck. His plastic eyes follow me, flickering and blinking randomly. I'm muttering, stupid, dumb, stupid idiot, him and John Henry, dumb face, Mr. I'm so, what a, doesn't even know, can't even, and is dumb, probably watching that stupid show, dumb league of ladybug losers, stupid insects, stupid, I finally stop, because I've got an idea, not a great one, not even a good one. It's an angry idea. One of those that you kind of know from the get-go you'll end up regretting if you actually follow through with it, but that it's just too tempting to ignore. Here's what I think I'll do. Go downstairs, turn on the TV, find the station that plays the League of Ladybugs, watch a few seconds, or enough so that I can get the gist of what's going on in the episode, then call up Dan and mercilessly make fun of him for spending his Friday afternoon sitting around all by himself watching such childish nonsense. After shoving Grieg back under my bed, that's what I do do. Only, I can't find the stupid show on TV. It's not playing on the station I thought it was on. So I flip through every channel, waiting through commercials if I have to, but I still I can't find the thing. I even scroll through the guide. I even enter the show's name into the search bar. It's nowhere to be found. I stand there in the living room for a minute, just staring at the TV. Then I go over to the computer. I search for the League of Ladybugs on the internet and quickly learn the reason why I can't find any trace of the show on television. It got canceled. The League of Ladybugs was taken off the air two years ago. And it's not like they've been showing reruns either. Apparently, one of the show's two creators sued the other one, and they've been in some long, messy court battle ever since. It's illegal, as in it's against the law, for any TV station to show a single episode. Learning this, my anger disappears. It gets zapped away, fast as lightning. Now I'm just upset. Hurt. Because if Dan hasn't been watching that stupid show these past two years, then, well, what has he been doing? Chapter 30 Saturday morning, I'm even more excited than usual to go see my grandpa. If before I had about a billion questions to ask him about Grieg, now I've got about a billion and a half. Also, I'll admit, after a Friday afternoon and evening spent with no one but the robot, well, I'm feeling a little lonely. It got kind of hard to think of Grieg as the world's coolest friend after he turned my bedroom into a disaster zone. And speaking of Grieg, before I get in Dad's car, I take some extra measures to make sure he doesn't get into any trouble while I'm gone. I duct tape each of his limbs to one of the four posts of my bed. Then I grab my old bike lock from the basement and fasten his neck to the frame. I don't think even Houdini can get out of this. Then we're off to Bright Horizons, and I know I've already said that that's the name of the retirement community where Grandpa lives, but I don't think I've explained yet just how bad of a name for the place that it is. The way it's set up, with a big central courtyard, and then all these identical apartments arranged in a rectangle around it, you can't even see the horizon. And not even if you're on the outside of the rectangle, at one of the apartment's front doors. The whole property is surrounded by these big trees. No matter where you are at the place, there's no way you can see the horizon. Not to mention, figure out if it's looking bright. But it's a nice enough place, I guess. Grandpa seems to like it fine. 
He spends his days on his little back patio in the shade of the speech umbrella we got him one year before his birthday. He keeps a small cup full of toothpicks on the table right beside him, and he just sits there, moving one of those little wooden sticks back and forth from one side of his mouth to the other, all the while watching the goings-on in the courtyard. On Saturday mornings, that's what I do too. Dad drops me off, then heads to the grocery store to buy a week's worth of the microwavable burritos that my grandpa eats for breakfast, lunch, dinner, and any every in-between meal snack. While Dad's gone, I sit with Grandpa and we talk. Well, I guess I should say that I talk. Grandpa, you see, doesn't talk much. Or at all, really. But we get each other nonetheless. I can't explain it, and sometimes it frustrates my mom and dad the way I can translate Grandpa's grunts and head shakes and eyebrow wiggles and shrugs into words, into questions and answers and comments and the like. That day, though, I'm more glad than ever that I can, because if I don't get a handle on this Greek situation soon, well, I don't know what'll happen. But I've got a feeling it might not be too good. Chapter 31 Grandpa's already out on the patio when I arrive. I take a seat and ask him how he's been. He moves the toothpick he's got in from one side of his mouth to the other. Then he shrugs his left shoulder. Then he tips his head back. Then he shrugs his right shoulder. I know, I tell him. It's been super nice out. Just this morning, Mom was saying it felt more like summer than spring. Grandpa pulls his toothpick from his mouth and tosses it into the grass. Then he reaches over to a nearby cup and slides out a brand new one. I wait for him to get the toothpick settled on one side of his mouth, and then I say, So. Grandpa raises the eyebrow nearest to me. I just, I have a few questions for you, if you don't mind. The eyebrow lifts a little higher. Oh, I say, they're about the gift. Now Grandpa's eyes sink. His lips, too. They dip down around his toothpick. He thinks for a second. Then he holds out a flat, downturned hand and moves it slowly forward. The train? I say. He nods and smiles. No, I tell him. Not the train. He's frowning again. And me? I'm starting to worry. Because what is this? A joke? Grandpa can be funny, but this isn't his kind of humor. The robot, I say. Grieg! He's still frowning at me. No, I say. Nothing? You don't have any idea what I'm talking about? Grandpa thinks. He thinks hard. Then he gives his head a single decisive shake. Chapter 32 If Grandpa didn't give me the robot, then who did? I don't have a clue. And that gives me the creeps. As soon as Dad stops the car in the driveway, I hop out and race inside and up to my room and make sure Grieg's still under my bed. I tried to, at least. But Mom's standing there at the bottom of the stairs with her arms spread out from one banister to the other. Two things, she says. I stand there and listen, but first heave a sigh to let her know that I'm kind of in a major rush. Mom hears it, obviously, but still takes her sweet time. Her first thing is that she and Dad are going to be gone for the rest of the day. They're going to a wedding or something. And she wants to know if I'll be all right on my own. Yeah, I tell her. Sure. The second thing Mom says is that I got a phone call while I was out. And when she says it, a big, warm wave of relief sweeps over me. From who? I ask her. Even though I don't need to, to I know who it is. Dan, of course. For one thing, nobody else ever calls me. And for another, it's been almost 24 hours since we've talked. That just doesn't happen. And no stupid argument about John Henry Knox and his dumb ideas should keep us from talking for that long. Not even the fact that Dan's been lying to me for the past two years about all that time he was supposedly spending watching the League of Ladybugs should do that. Though, yeah, I do expect a decent explanation about it. 
But more important, I need to talk to him. To my best friend. I need to talk to him about Grieg. Bad. When Mom doesn't answer me, I try again. Mom! She rolls her eyes and says, Why don't you check the message pad, Ken? That's the little pad of paper Mom keeps beside the phone. She's been trying for years to get me and my dad into the habit of using it. I heave a second sigh, then head to the kitchen to read the piece of paper. I reach for the phone at the same time and even start thumbing in Dan's number. That's when my eyes actually start dragging across the words Mom wrote. I stop. Because it's not Dan's name I'm seeing. The pad says, John Henry Knox. I actually gasp. And Mom, having now given me enough time to use her beloved message pad, steps into the kitchen behind me and says, He told me to tell you that he got one too. He didn't say what one was, just that you'd understand. A few seconds pass, then a few more. I can practically feel the color draining from my face. Ken? Mom says. Ken? Did you eat one of Grandpa's burritos? Are you going to be sick? Chapter 33 I take a second to compose myself. Deep breaths, soothing thoughts. Then I pick up the phone and dial the digits scribbled down on the message pad. I'm expecting John Henry Knox to answer. Or I guess John Henry Knox's mom or dad or one of his sisters. What I'm not expecting is this. Top of the morning, I am Sveen, property of Mr. John Henry, re, 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 Knox. For a second, I can't do anything. Then my brain jolts into panic mode and I've got questions, loads of them. Where was it? At your house? Did you see it get delivered? Was your name on the box? There's no answer. Then, I am Sveen, property of, I hang up. Wait a second. The phone rings. I answer. Hello? Did you just hang up? It's John Henry Knox. Yes, I tell him. Now, are you ready to tell me what happened? John Henry Knox clears his throat and says, Earlier this morning, I went out to get the newspaper, the Wall Street Journal, if you were wondering. I wasn't. You see, I've invested in a number of startup companies, most of those in computing, robotics, and telecommunications sectors, though I do have a small amount of money in a company that builds luxury mobile disaster shelters. I literally couldn't care less. A little more than halfway down the path that leads from our veranda to the front gates, where our mailbox is located, I noticed something strange and unfamiliar clouding the periphery of my vision. I turned and saw the box. Large, brown, obviously repurposed. My name was on it, but there was no address. Confirming my hypothesis that the box had been hand-delivered, now you're surely wondering how I reached this hypothesis. Nope. Through observation only, by way of series of logical inferences, I... I hang up there. I've got all the information I want. And if I have to listen to John Henry Knox for another second, well, burrito or no burrito, I really might puke. Chapter 34 The phone rings and rings, but I ignore it. I'm thinking, questioning. Why me? Why me and John Henry Knox? Who, having access to these machines, would choose to give them to a couple of kids? Maybe smarter than average and pretty technically proficient kids, but kids all the same. It's almost like we, the engine nerds, are being targeted. But why? The phone finally shuts up, but a second later it's replaced by a new noise. Knocking. I go and answer the door. It's Jerry. Smiling, his biggest smile. I open my mouth to say hi, but before I can make a sound, I notice what's sitting at the end of my driveway. A big, beaten up box. Jerry's name is written on the side. It's heavy, he tells me. Then he holds up a skateboard, or what used to be a skateboard. Now it's in two pieces, 
snapped right down the middle. Still smiling, Jerry leans towards me and whispers, I think it's a robot. And me? I don't answer. I can't answer. All I can do is stand there and gape at the box while my mind spins and twirls like some sort of sickening, high-speed merry-go-round. Chapter 35 Jerry seems fine, but I'm not. I'm confused and worried, and even more confused still. I don't know what to do, but what I do do is leave Jerry there on the porch and run inside to check on Grieg. He's still there, thank God, taped up and locked to my bed. Back downstairs, I hurry out onto the porch and find my mom standing there talking to Jerry. She sees me panting, looking panicked, and frowns. Ken, she says, is everything okay? I nod because I don't trust myself to open my mouth and try to use my words. But my mom doesn't seem convinced. She turns to Jerry. Thankfully, he's still smiling. He gives my mom a wink and then also a big thumbs up. A car horn honks. It's my dad in the driveway. My mom hesitates, and I can tell she wants to ask more questions. But then my dad honks again, and instead of launching an interrogation, mom just gives me the usual spiel. Be good. Be safe. Call if you need anything. Then she goes. I wait for the car to pull out of the driveway and only then let out the breath I've been holding in. Then I start pacing back and forth across the porch, thinking things through. Jerry doesn't seem to mind. He takes a seat, pulls a carton of chocolate milk from out of nowhere, and slowly sips away at it. So, I say. Jerry quits sipping long enough to say, So, too. This morning, I continue, both you and John Henry Knox received packages similar to the one that I received a couple days ago. Now I ask you, could this be a simple coincidence? Could it merely be a chance that not one, not two, but three of us found these packages on our doorstep? Jerry lets go of his straw. Lawn. I turn to him. Blink. What? Jerry smiles. I don't have a doorstep. The box was on my lawn. Drink your milk, I tell him. He drinks. The answer is no, I say, pacing again. Not unless there were dozens, not unless there were hundreds of these things being distributed throughout town. And even then, the likelihood of the three of us all getting these boxes within a span of 48 hours? Well, even then, it would be hard to believe that there wasn't something strange, something strange and purposeful going on. I turn to Jerry. Right? Jerry doesn't stop slurping his chocolate milk, but he does give me a thumbs up. Right, I say, and I don't know about you, but it doesn't seem to me like these robots are here to store food or whatever. Based on the way mine's behaving, I'd say they're here to take all our food. It's like they want us to starve or something. But what kind of sick, twisted person would do that? Who would ever actually unleash these things? What kind of an evil lunatic would do something so irresponsible, so... So insane! This time, I'm not looking for an answer from Jerry, but he gives one anyway. He says, Dan. Huh? Dan, he says again, pointing at something over my shoulder. I turn. Dan's standing there at the bottom of the porch steps. Hey, he says. He's got his hands in his pocket like he's embarrassed or something. Do you guys have a second? I think... I think we should talk. Chapter 36 I don't know what Dan wants to talk about, but I also don't really care. Not right now. Dan, I say, some kind of evil lunatic is sending engine nerds these robots. I don't know why, but I've got a feeling that it's maybe not so good. So feel free to stick around or whatever, but right now Jerry and I are busy figuring out just who the heck is doing this to me. Dan gulps. Then he says, me. Huh? I say. Dan takes a breath and then spells it out for me nice and clear. Me, he says. I'm the one sending engine nerds the robots. Me. There's a sound, a hollow sort of gurgling. It's Jerry. 
He's finished his carton of chocolate milk. He sets the thing aside, smiles. That, he says, is very, very amazing. Chapter 37. Amazing, I shriek, because I am not amazed. All my feeling is anger and confusion, and there's too much of them inside of me for any other emotions to fit. But Jerry's so amazed that he's begun to giggle and clap. Shut it, Jerry, I snap at him. Then I turn to Dan. Another secret, huh? More lies? I don't know why I'm even surprised. Because I know about the show, Dan. That stupid TV show. It's been off the air. It's been gone for two years. And you've been lying to me. To me! For two years! Dan doesn't try to deny it. I know, he says. And I'm sorry. I really am. But listen, please. The robots... I think I might have miscalculated. He looks straight at me. I need your help, Ken. Oh, really? I say. You do. You need my help? I do, Dan says. Yours and Jerry's and whoever else's. I throw my head back and laugh. My help? Our help? No, 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 no. Me and Jerry, which... By the way, sorry, Jerry, for snapping at you and everything. Jerry and I aren't helping you. That's not how it works, Dan. You don't lie to your friends for two whole years and then come and ask for their help. Nuh-uh. Go get out of here. Go. Dan doesn't leave. Instead, he says, I'm worried, Ken. Please? The robots. I made a lot of them. I know, I tell him. I've got one, and so does John Henry Knox, and now so does Jerry. That's his in the driveway. No, Dan says. You don't get it. There's, there's, the, the. Yes, there's three, I say for him. I know how to count, Dan. He shakes his head and then goes on shaking it for a good long time. Finally, I get it. There's more, I say. My voice suddenly emptied of anger and hurt. Now it's just shaky, full of fear. Dan nods. Okay, I say slowly, like the answer will be different. Maybe better if I ask my question carefully. How many more than three? A dozen, Dan says. No, I gasp. Then with a tiny shrug, he adds, Plus another three. Chapter 38. Eighteen. One. Eight. That's how old you have to be to buy a lottery ticket, vote for president, or go and see an R-rated movie by yourself. That's the number of eggs there are in those oversized cartons that once you pull them out of the fridge, you can never seem to fit back in again. That's how many kids there are in my class. I stick with that. With the image of my classroom, every one of the desks taken up by a student. I shut my eyes, and I can see it. There's Lisa, there's Isabel, there's Chris. I hold them all there in my mind, and then attempt to replace each of them with a walking, talking, bottomlessly hungry robot. But it's not easy. It's like my brain is trying to drag its way up a steep hill. A steep hill that keeps getting swept over with avalanches and loose gravel. So I open my eyes back up and ask Dan the question pulsing in my brain. How? Slowly, Dan fills up his lungs with air. Then he talks for about ten minutes straight. He tells me and Jerry the craziest story I've ever heard.